the security guards and have you run out as some kind of nutcase because this has been so thoroughly blacked out because it is so real and it stretches back so far. Slide. So now we do know, and these pictures have suddenly surfaced, that they were building long past the 1950s Avro car. That they did have flying saucers operating, and they were able to fly. And the question becomes, were, were they powered by just some sort of exotic jet, as they would have us believe, or do they have anti-gravity? I've had people very conversant in the aviation field tell me that the SR-71 Blackbird stealth fighter, that it looks like it really shouldn't be able to fly. So there is some theory, theory that, yes, it's got jets on it, and yes, they roll it out, and you can see it flame and go down the runway, and it all takes off, but there are leading edges of certain material, and there are some electronics on board that they can kick on, and that we are actually using anti-gravity right now, okay? And what I would like to know, and the big conundrum is, do the pilots even know? Okay, maybe they're told this is a some sort of system. You know, flip this switch here. You know, you, have, you know how you do an aircraft. You got to, everything's written down. You just flip stuff, and you're you're told basically how everything works. Maybe they're told it's the cooling system or something. You know. So again, we have technology that obviously stressed back through all of human history that's being kept from us. Slide. Although I think that's it. Okay, here are some of the recent sightings of these giant triangular craft. Are they them or us? Are they human ingenuity? Are they shadow government test craft that they're using? Or are they reverse engineering of ET craft? Or are they, and what are they being built for? And why would they test stuff? All of y'all familiar with the uh, flyover of Phoenix, Arizona? back in 19, when was that, 97, I believe it. Yeah, okay, that's a big deal. Big triangular craft, went over Phoenix, very slow, turned, moved off. But here's a good example of how they cover these things up. This occurred about 8.30 at night. Thousands of people saw this thing. And uh, then sometime between 8.30 and 10.30, Somebody contacted the Maryland State Guard and ordered them to fly a training mission to Phoenix to the Barry Goldwater Gunnery Range and drop flares. So about 10.30 that night, they did just that. Now, the Phoenix papers were full of this story the next day, but it never went anywhere else. Remember what I said about the distribution of the news? But three months later, in June of 1997, USA Today suddenly did a story on this thing that flew over Phoenix and all the rest of the magpie journalists, they all went and all of a sudden there was a brief blurb about this whole thing, okay? Well, the official version was, of course, that, well, it was just flares dropped by the Maryland State Guard. So some of the reporters who were a little bit ahead of their fellows actually contacted the Maryland State Guard and they said, yeah, we flew out there and we dropped flares. They went, oh, okay. Case closed. It was just flares. They dropped over military flares over Phoenix. Nobody bothered to check that they dropped the flares two hours after they saw this thing fly over the city. But the key part of that story is, is that it didn't only fly over Phoenix, one of the most populous cities in the state, but came down the entire length of the state right through the most populated corridor. Now, if it's a secret government test craft, why in the world would they fly over the most populated area. Why don't they go down to Big Bend in Texas? You know, you could fly around there all night and nobody but, you know, some prospector in a, in a, in a uh, coat would see you. It's amazing. Are they setting us up for the next game after the war on terrorism? If the war on terrorism collapses and all of a sudden nobody's buying that anymore, what's next? Invasion from space? Yeah. Give up the last of your liberties so we can protect you from invasion of space. I'm going to leave you with one cheery thought, okay? As we can see, there's lots of evidence that perhaps the reason we had to go into Iraq was to grab these ancient secrets of energy manipulation, the secrets that could open up limitless free energy, which would wreck the oil economy, of course, longevity, which would wreck the medical establishment, the pharmaceutical 
ha uh, corporations, which are all based on petrochemicals, by the way, and et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps that's the reason that we had to invade Iraq, to get our hands and get control over this ancient technology. But what worries me is that right now, as we meet right here today, somewhere deep underground probably, there is a covert government-sponsored lab where we have scientists and working on this, and they are tampering with the basic building blocks of the universe. And why does that bother me? Because in the spring of 1945 at Alamogordo, New Mexico, when they set off the first atomic bomb, more than half of the scientists working on the Manhattan Project sincerely, devoutly believed that once they started a nuclear chain reaction, they would not be able to stop it. It would ignite the atmosphere, and it would incinerate the Earth. But they set it off anyway. Whew. Glad we were wrong about that. And that's pretty scary. Somebody says, well, let's try this. Flips a switch, and the whole universe winks out of existence. Now, again, it, maybe it's just because of my libertarian instincts, or maybe it's self-preservation. But I think we need to know about this stuff. The time for this military industrial secrecy is over with. If we're going to continue to call ourselves a free people, we have to have free knowledge of what the heck's going on. Now, I was in the military. I was even in Army intelligence. I do realize that there are some secrets, strategies, a disposition of troops, etc. There are some secrets that need to be held in true national security. But when they're dealing with all our lives, all our futures, all of our possibilities for life on this planet, I'm afraid that that goes a little bit beyond just national security. Now, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. I, th I thought I'd kind of run over my time there a little bit. Believe me, I hurried through that. There was a whole lot more we could have talked about. We'll start and go this way. Yeah. Are you pointing at him or me? Yeah. Great, mm -hmm. thanks. You left off with a comment that may be related, if not to come back to a little bit later, about who are they? It was before this. Oh. So just to plant that seed and remind us. Okay, we, you saw what the Sumerian tablet said. The Anunnaki come down, okay? And uh, these are these ETs colonized the planet, apparently, okay? Now, one of the problems they had was they started interbreeding with these, their worker race, okay? And this produced the men of renown that the Bible refers to as the Nephilim. Go back in uh, Genesis and read what it says. It says, the sons of God mated with the daughters of men and created the Nephilim. They are the hybrids. It's us. And then the hybrids, of course, kept going, and, and that's why on down today, we're all related to these star people, because that's where we came from. But now there are some among us who are more related than others. And this is why, beginning with the Pharaohs, the Babylonians, and the Egyptians, and the, the Caesars, and the kings, the monarchies of Europe, the Nazis, what was their big concern? The bloodline the bloodline. You, whoever the rulers think that they have the right to rule the rest of us human cattle because they uh, are of the more direct bloodline. And that is your they. Okay, now we could get into names, some of which you would recognize like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, but then there's other, lots of other names, the black nobility of Europe. Go get a roster of the Bilderbergers and you'll pretty much figure out who they are. No, 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 they created them while they're here. In fact, um, he, he, this fellow back here pointed out that, that it didn't all start in Mesopotamia, it started in Africa, and he's absolutely correct, okay? But if you read the tablets, you'll find that the, oh, it gets complicated, but uh, there was a being known as Enlil who was the mission commander. And they, they, initially, they landed in the uh, Persian Gulf. And initially, they began to try to extract gold from the water. But that was a slow, tedious process, and they weren't getting much gold. 
So that's when they decided they had to go out and start excavating for gold. And so now you find ancient gold mines in Africa, in South